Good morning or good evening in John's case. And thank you for joining us today for this K92 uh, mining webinar. Uh, my name is Derek McPherson. I'm a mining research analyst here at uh, Red Cloud Securities. Um, K92 has been one of the better performing gold miners over the last couple of years as the companies continue to execute operationally while at the same time expanding uh, production and resources that's high grade K2 mine in Papua New Guinea. Today I have with me on, on the webinar, John Lewins, CEO and director. And I'd like to thank John very much for joining us from Perth, uh, Perth this evening. Yeah, morning, all or good day. That'll cover everything. That covers everything. Um, so today for the webinar, uh, John will provide an update on K92 focused on the, the recent resource released two weeks ago uh, and what that means for K92 going forward. Uh, and then after that, we'll take your questions live uh, on the webinar. So please send in your questions via the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, you can type your, type your questions in the chat box at any time. To start with, we'll, we'll handle the disclosures uh, and then we'll get into it. For K92, uh, there may be some forward looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of K92's corporate presentation located on the company's website. For WebCloud Securities, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. With that out of the way, uh, I'll turn it over to John uh, to provide you the update on K92 and what have investors have to look forward to uh, with the company. John? Okay, thanks for that. So, K92, uh, growing production transformative uh, discoveries. Um, and let me explain why. As mentioned, the uh, forward-looking and cautionary statement that I'm sure everybody is extremely familiar with and can probably recite without having to even read it. So, start. Why K92? Rapid production growth. Um, stage two expansion uh, is well advanced, and we'll get into that. CapEx has been effectively uh, uh, spent. Um, and that's looking at 150% uh, growth from 2018 to the two step to stage two life of mine. So 2018, 47,000 answers gold equivalent produced, 2019, 82,000. Life of mine, stage three, 120,000 answers. Significant resource growth. Um, we're up 450% uh, on measured indicated, 120% on our inferred uh, resource from uh, 2017 to our recently announced resource. Um, I make the point, all of that is within our mining lease and is actually within uh, a kilometer effectively of where we're mining right now. We've got currently uh, five rigs on the, uh, on the, the lease. Uh, three of those are underground and two are on the uh, surface and uh, in addition to that, we've got another three rigs that are coming um, in the next month or so. We've got a large high grade tier one asset resource. Um, we're high, high grade, low cost underground operation. We're in the bottom hand of the bottom hand, bottom half of the cost curve. All in sustaining costs in, in uh, 2018 uh, was 796, uh, 680 in 2019 and uh, longer term under the life of mine of the current stage two that would be um, sub 700. We've got a large land package over 700 square kilometers surrounding our mining lease so right in that uh, very very area and we've got a number of targets with uh, some drilling already done and a more drilling planned and we have a, a very experienced team with a with a great proven track record. Um, something like plus 200 years experience in Papua New Guinea within our team. So when you look at the at the grades um, over the last 12 months, you'll see that uh, Kenantu comes in at number four at uh, just over 19 grams per tonne. So as I said, very high grade. Looking at the resource and, and looking at resources uh, uh, listed that are um, plus five million ounces, and you look at the undergrounds and you can see that uh, Cora, the resource at Kenantu, comes in at uh, third equal highest grade, 9.6 grams per tonne. 
So large resource, high grade. In terms of our corporate structure, very clean. 250, 215 million shares uh, on issue, about 17 million options, which are with our uh, primarily with our execs. Um, so fully diluted, 232 million. Uh, insider ownership, 10%. Currently, uh, cash, 21, a little bit more than that right now, um, having done a few more sales since this was put together. And uh, debt wise we have debt uh, again a little bit less than that we made a couple of payments so about uh, 10 million dollars of debt so we're in a net cash position net cash position um we've got uh we had a contingent payment to barrick we got rid of that last year we had a gold loan we got rid of that last year we had a royalty we got rid of that last year so very very clean um in terms of analyst coverage you'll see there's a, there's a list there um with uh, coverage by eight institutions with uh, Desjardins just having uh, launched last week. Institutional shareholder base, I, I think is is certainly one of the best of, of uh, companies in, in our sort of uh, class, including uh, 1832, RBC, uh, Formula Growth, Donald Smith. So very, um, very North American centric, although we do have uh, uh, some that are coming out of Europe, London, uh, and also Asia, um, uh, even a couple of uh, a couple of Aussies. Management team and directors, um, yeah. Well, there's uh, there's some probably reasonably well known names there. Um, we did uh, we did have the photos of everyone uh, on that page, but apparently it, uh, the photos uh, the complaint was it looked like a, a bunch of convicts, um, which uh, being an Australian, we actually thought was a good idea, but apparently it's not. So uh, no folders, but what it's showing it really is that we've got, we've got a lot of corporate experience there and we've got a lot of operational experience there. So um, moving on operationally, socially responsible mining. For us, that means that we're very focused on employing locals. Over 95% of our people come from PNG. And the majority, about 65% of them, are actually our landowners. Um, we're creating more jobs right now as we, as we go along with uh, the expansion that's going on. We've got uh, one of the best safety records in the Australasian region. We have had one lost time incident in the last four years. Very high focus on environmental uh, uh, compliance. We've got one of the smallest footprints that you would see. We're an underground operation um, operating a traditional tailings dam. Um, and going forward, that's the sort of project we'll continue to be. Um, and importantly, a lot of our tailings we are actually looking at in the next phase of expansion that we'll be going back underground as well. So we'll actually be improving our footprint even though we're, we're looking at expansion. Quite recently, we uh, announced a, the establishment of a COVID fund, um, which was uh, 1.5 million Kina, about $450,000, which was to provide support to uh, government, both at provincial level and national level, for um, things such as PPE, test kits, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think uh, very well received. And again, one of the first companies in the country to be doing that. Um, Looking at uh, our communities themselves, where our focus is creating business opportunities and we have uh, multiple business type opportunities there. And you'll, you'll see the uh, uh, truck there, which is part of one of the uh, contracts. Um, tertiary education scholarships, over 50 tertiary education scholarships um, for our landowners. And that uh, um, that is that is growing. This is the third year that we've been, uh, we've been running this. Um, we have uh, agreement in place with the University of Technology, um, which is all sorts of things, including that uh, um, people from the university come to the mine to get their uh, practical experience. Every, every graduate has their practical experience. 75% of all graduates at the University of Technology covering mining and metallurgy actually got their experience at K92. 
Um, we've got a, we've got a numerous uh, infrastructure service development programs going on, covering water, schools, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then women empowerment programs. And then of course we've got, uh, I think this year about 8 million going into exploration. So uh, looking at development of our resource for the future. So PNG, um, it's immediately to the north of Australia. Um, one of the most interesting and I think beautiful countries uh, in the world, a bit over 8 million people, 800 languages, incredibly diverse. Um, at the same time, something like 200,000 taxpayers. So it's also a, a, a country that, that has the vast majority of its people are subsistence farmers. And so in, uh, in working in that environment, you've got to recognize that uh, land is really important to the people that you're dealing with. Um, in terms of location, PNG can be very challenging. Uh, it's, a, it's a very mountainous uh, uh, country um, and being right up there in the tropics, very high rainfall as well. So if you look at Octeti, eight to 10 meters of rain a year, right up in the highlands, Porvora, six to eight meters again, um, up in the highlands, uh, Hidden Valley, 300 and odd days rain a year. You come down to Kanantu, veritable desert, two and a half meters of rain a year. Um, and when you look at our actual location, um, we are right next to the highway. Um, so we're only about uh, eight kilometers off the highway to the mine itself. That highway goes straight down to the Port of Ley, uh, largest port in PNG. That's the port that services quite a bit of the mining industry, including the likes of Porgra and Ramu, as well as the agricultural industry within the Markham Valley. And we actually sit within the Markham Valley, so we're not up in the highlands. We're in what's called the Markham Valley. It's about 20 kilometers across where we are. Very flat, um, set in between the uh, two mountain ranges. So we've got all the real estate that we require to build all of our infrastructure, plant, tailing stand, camp, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, we're one of only two mines in the country on grid power. We get our power from the Yonke hydroelectric facility. So within PNG, the uh, uh, Kinantu is, is about the best possible location you could possibly, uh, you could possibly have. So the mine itself, it's an underground mine. Um, uh, what surprises some people is it's an underground mine that you actually go up into. Uh, we acquired it, as, uh, as many would know, from, from Barrick in 2015, uh, refurbished it and brought it, started bringing it back into production in 2017. In our acquisition, um, part of our strategy was that we would continue development and get over to the Cora resource, which we saw as a far better uh, and longer term resource in Umafimpa, which had a limited life and, and certainly some challenges and historically had been very difficult to mine. Um, our, our view of geology said that uh, we thought that Cora, Cora would actually extend to the north towards the Rumafimpa. And we tested this, uh, this theory with uh, one of our first holes from underground, KNDD0009, um, which hit 5.4 meters, 11.7 grams per ton gold, 25 silver, and 1.3% copper at about 190 meters. We drilled that in uh, May. 2017 and um, some five months later in October 2017 we had developed across to to that area and we'd taken a bulk sample of 2,000 tons put it through the plant and we've got uh, over 90 percent gold 90 percent copper recovery we would already shown from continuing drilling that we had over a year of resource ahead of us so we committed to developing Cora. And four months later, at the end of January 2018, we declared commercial production on Cora. Um, that was a profitable quarter, that first quarter of 2018. We've continued along that vein. And that first quarter was actually the first quarter that uh, the Canento mine had ever been profitable. So we've come a long way since then. Um, we declared the first resource at what we called Cora North um, in uh, October 2000, uh, 2018. And just recently, we've expanded that so that we basically joined up Cora North and Cora into one large substantial resource, as you can see there. 
um, which contains uh, 1.1 million ounces of nitrogen indicated and 3.7 million ounces of inferred. Um, the discovery cost for our drilling that we've that we've completed there, that basically has has added uh, over 3.2 million ounces to Cora, it's been less than five dollars an ounce. So this is a very cost effective expansion of resource. You look at operational performance, you can see that uh, we've obviously been uh, basically increasing production as we've uh, as we've gone along. Development wise, we went from uh, operating one level during 2018 to operating three levels and finishing the year with five levels in 2019. And currently, we have uh, seven levels that we've now uh, we've now got into. So we've very much been opening up uh, the mine itself. Plant wise. Very simple uh, uh, flow sheet, two-stage crushing, milling, and flotation. Flotation produces a copper gold concentrate, currently running two to 300 gram per ton and around six to 8% copper. Um, we have uh, introduced a gravity circuit, which um, is uh, being optimized um, and actually needs a new flotation plant in there as well to fully optimize. Um, up to 50% of the gold will be gravity recoverable. And with the uh, commissioning of the next stage, we'll actually see more of that gold coming out in Dore and our concentrate grades going up in terms of copper to around 20%, whereas the, the gold will stay around about where it is right now. So there's no sound idation or anything else. This is a, this is a very simple, straightforward circuit. So we... We saw Cora basically as three stages. The first stage, 200,000 tons per annum, um, generating about 50,000 ounces. In fact, uh, as you saw in 2019, we, uh, we got 80,000 ounces out of it. Um, the second stage was an expansion to double throughput. And really the doubling of throughput was controlled by the plant, um, where the mill was a size that for a very low capex, $15 million, we could double our throughput increase our average production to 120,000 ounces uh, gold equivalent per year, um, $15 million cost and projected after tax cash flow uh, plus a billion dollars. So some fairly uh, uh, substantial cash flow um, and a quite outstanding NPV as well. So we committed to that project at the beginning of 2019. We had basically uh, spent all that money by the first quarter of this year. We're due to commission the plant expansion at the end of March, um, but as I'll get into it, this, due to the state, COVID state of emergency, that uh, expansion right now is on hold, although underground we're still working to expand uh, production from underground, and uh, at this point in time, we should hit that by the end of the year, which is, which is what we had uh, planned for this year. And then stage three was to continue with that underground surface exploration provide a resource update uh, this year, which we've now done, and then complete a PEA on the next phase of expansion. Um, and we're busy with the PEA right now, and we'll get into that one. Okay. So in terms of stage two expansion, we basically more than doubled our underground fleet, uh, brought in 45-ton trucks, 17-ton loaders, uh, graders, twin boom jumbos, et cetera, et cetera. And to put that into some context, um, the mine, when it was last operated by Barrick, was operating uh, 11 ton loaders, uh, sorry, 11 ton trucks underground. Our loaders are now bigger than the trucks that were being operated underground. So it's an entirely different operation. A bulk emulsion system, we've upgraded the power reticulation system, we've upgraded our ventilation system with three times the power. Um, we've got new offices at the uh, portal, busy with new workshop. Um, so really moved on quite uh, quite dramatically in that case. In uh, other areas, um, basically expanded the camp by uh, some 40% and we're still uh, expanding further right now. We've commissioned new mess and kitchen. And then you can see the, uh, the additional flotation, additional crusher, et cetera, all of which has uh, been installed and is sitting there ready to commission. So what has that resulted in? You can see in 2019, Total mine material movement went from 
just under 60,000 to over 120,000 tonnes um, over the last uh, five quarters, from the first quarter of last year to the first quarter of this year. Underground development metres from just under 500 metres to over 1,500 metres, so a threefold increase in our development metres. And that's the, the 1,500 is about where we need to be at this point in time. One of the important aspects is that the resource update that we did in uh, October 2018, when we've reconciled back to it on a quarter by quarter basis, you'll see that every single quarter we produce more ounces than the resource model says we do. So that resource model is based on two veins, the K1 and the K2 vein. Um, there's no top cut applied to either of those veins. Um, however, we produce something like 15% more gold than the model says we should. And interestingly, the updated model, the, up, the new model that we just produced, which has combined all of the resource together, even using that model, when we go back to the area that we have mined out, we find that we've actually mined more ounces than that model says that we should, we should have actually got out of it. And that is primarily associated with grade. So basically we get more grade out of this mine than the resource model says we should. So if we come into the new uh, 43101 independent resource, you'll see um, we're now sitting at 1.1 uh, million ounces, 10.4 gram per tonne uh, gold, uh, gold equivalent rather, um, in our measure and indicated, and uh, 3.7 million at nine gram per tonne in our inferred. Really, really important here. When we, when we set this out and when we were communicating with people last year, we we had uh, just under 400,000 ounces of measure and indicated the target was to get to double that to 800,000 ounces. In fact, we've almost tripled it to 1.1 million ounces. So we're extremely pleased with that. Inferred, um, gone up by 50% from about 2.4 million ounces to 3.7. So a total there of about 4.8 million ounces, which, um, which is about spot on for where our target was to get to. One of the really important things in this, in this resource is when you start looking at your grade tonnage curves and you can see the resource is reported at at a gram per ton at, at a gram per ton lower cutoff now when you look at a two gram per ton cutoff and you look at your measure and indicated at one gram you're 1.1 million ounces 10 and a half grams per ton at a two gram cutoff one million ounces 12.6 grams per ton your grade has gone up 20 percent but your ounces are only down 10 percent in the inferred, even more pronounced. You're going from 9 grams per tonne to 11.8, so you're up 30% on your grade, but your resource has only gone from 3.7 to 3.3, so just over 10% reduction. Um, and this continues. If you go to 5 grams per tonne, your grade on your measure and indicator goes up to 20.5 grams per tonne, so it's almost double. Um, and your answers are down to 800 thousand ounces so you're down just under 30 percent in terms of answers again looking at the inferred you've gone from 9 to 19.8 so more than double the grade and the resource goes from 3.7 down to 2.6 so again it's uh, under 30 percent uh, reduction in your answers so it's giving you that that clear picture of a very very high grade core within this resource when you look at our long-term long cutoff, marginal cutoff, you're looking at about two grams per ton. So it gives you an idea about what you can actually be mining. Um, as you can see with these slides, we're showing uh, K1 at one gram, K1 at two grams, and then K2 at one and two. And again, you're seeing that higher grade core. And then pushing up to five grams at K1 and K2, you can still see very consistent core of these uh, high grades that hang together pretty well. So the resource itself, um, last year we were giving the, the target is basically that area in green. And you can see the area in brown within that area in green. That's where we define the, the resource. What's important here is that there's about 25% of that area that doesn't have a resource in it right now. And it doesn't have a resource, not because we haven't been successful in, in defining that, but because we haven't drilled there yet. Our hit rate when we drill is almost 100% on this on this system. Um, so one of the analysts was asking us you know, where, how we decide where to drill, what the target was. 
And I actually showed them this slide without the resource and said, you see that area in green? Yep. He said, we're drilling in there. And he said, no, no, I get that. But where in there? Because your hit rate is so high. And we said, well, anywhere in there. That's the target. And so the continuity of the system is quite, uh, quite outstanding. And right now, we're drilling as we speak, and we're drilling in that, uh, in that area that has no resource. And certainly over the balance of this year and into next year, we anticipate filling all of that area up and, in fact, it, uh, looking at drilling beyond that area into our, our, our exploration lease next door. And we'll also be continuing to drill high intensity, as you can see in the uh, northern central part there, where we get all of our measurements indicated. That will be pushed all the way to the end of the lease. And so we'll be looking to basically double our measured indicated answers um, by the next resource. So <clears throat> we look to the next phase, and that's phase three, as we call it. Um, the PEA for that is well underway. Um, we anticipate having a draft of that uh, towards the end of this month, and then looking at getting a, a, an updated 43101, incorporating the new resource and the PEA um, first half of July. Um, at this point in time, we believe that's something in the order of a million tons per annum and producing 250, 300,000 ounces um, per year, gold equivalent, capital cost 250, 300 million. Um, and at this point in time, cash cost certainly sub uh, 600, all in sustaining sub 750, probably sub, sub 700. Um, in looking at bringing that project in, we're looking at a PEA, the, uh, as I said, draft end of June, 43101 out. And then in the next quarter, we will start our feasibility study with a target to have that completed by Q2 next year with a formal decision to go ahead um, mid, mid next year to Q3. When we looked at the project, um, one of the issues that we saw was the lead time to bring it into production. And that lead time would be relatively long at three and a half years due to the need to, to develop a new twin incline system to be able to get you those tonnage out and to be able to open the, operate, the, the new mine up. Um, given that, we committed to that twin incline earlier this year. Um, we've basically done all the surface prep work. We were about to take the first cut in April when the state of emergency was declared. And so we put that on, on hold, but uh, we anticipate restarting that in the next quarter. That twin incline is a five by five and a six by six. And, and starting that now, what that, what that means is that the project that we're now looking at is now more like two years rather than three and a half years. So with a decision to go ahead mid 2021, you're looking at commissioning that project second half of 2023. Um, that twin incline is about $30 million. It's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, two, um, two developments, as I said, a 5x5 five five and a 6x6. Six six. Cost is about $30 million. That's spending about a million dollars a month on that to develop. And uh, for any miners among you, you're probably going to say, well, that's oversized for a million tons per annum, and you'd be totally correct. Um, we believe that would be able to handle up to 3 million tons per annum. So we've allowed for phase four, maybe phase five. So that sort of covered core and where we sit right now, just uh, briefly exploration high priority targets near the, uh, near the mine. Cora, Cora Deeps, busy with right now from underground, three rigs drilling, fourth rig um, is due on site uh, late this month, early next month for underground. So we'll be drilling from next quarter with four rigs from underground. Two of those rigs will basically be focused on exploration, adding additional ounces. The other two rigs will be focused on increasing our measurement indicated and carrying out grade control, which is, which is actually how we get a lot of our measurement indicated. And so we anticipate filling in that 25% area that, that has no resource in it by first quarter next year. And obviously we expect a commensurate increase in our resource. And as I said, we're targeting doubling the measurement indicated. Beyond that, we've got a parallel vein system to the uh, northeast called Judd. Judd has only got a couple of holes in it so far. Best hole, I think, was drilled by Barrick, three meters at 278. 
about 100, 150 meters below that. Highlands had drilled a hole that was uh, uh, about nine meters at eight and 1% copper. So we know it's got very high grade. It has not been drilled to any significant amount. So we will be drilling that this year as well. Interestingly, Judd is, um, as I said, about 150 meters to the northeast. All of our underground development actually sits between Judd and Cora. So those underground rigs, if we turn them around 180 degrees from where they drill currently, they'll be drilling into Judd, and that's part of what we're doing this year. Um, Carempe, which is uh, another parallel vein system, only this time it is to the uh, southwest. Uh, Carempe is about 400 meters to the southwest, right on the edge of the mining lease. Um, we actually had started the first hole uh, drilled there. Um, just as a state of emergency was declared, we were down about 50 meters and uh, we put it on hold. Um, we expect to be back in and to uh, continue drilling that uh, either later this month or early next month. Um, originally thought to be quite a, a limited vein, um, but uh, a landslide that occurred quite a number of years ago opened up and showed that it was actually quite an extensive vein, something like a um, kilometer of strike length now believed um, and some very very high grades from surface sampling that we've done has also had some artisanal workings on it which again uh, shown it to be high grade so we're uh, we'll be busy drilling that and quite excited about that one and then uh, to the uh, north east again we've got Maniapi and Aracompa two systems um, that between them had a resource of almost one and a half million ounces historical um, we don't have the core anymore. They were drilled before Highlands, um, and we plan to be up and drilling those um, at some point later in this year. Um, so there you have just within a relatively limited area, um, some five, six high grade veins, all believed to have emanated from, from one porphyry structure called A1 Headwater, which has never been drilled and is a target of ours for next year. We drilled 10 to maybe 20% of the known vein systems coming from that. And we're sitting currently with a, a, a total resource of uh, 1.3 million ounces, measured and indicated 3.9 million ounces of inferred. And then you've got that historical resource of another one and a half. But, so you, what you're seeing is, is, a, is a very, very substantial high grade field. And there you can see some of it uh, on the surface. Um, and Judd, as I said, the 278 at three and then the 8.3 at nine meters. So finally, in closing, um, outside of that high grade um, epithermal systems, vein systems, we've got quite a number of porphyry systems within our exploration area. And I, I, I'd make the point that the Porphyries are the reason that Barrick bought this asset in the first place. They weren't interested in the Kinantu mine, relatively small mine, no matter how high grade. Their focus was actually on the porphyry targets. And uh, they, they owned the project for approximately seven years and they drilled uh, 13 holes that went into porphyries, another 26 into core. Um, and we've reviewed all of the work that was done and we've gone out and done um, basic work going out into the field, uh, identified some uh, additional targets. And uh, the best of those, in fact, was uh, Blue Lake. Uh, Blue Lake is our number one porphyry target at this point in time. It was not even known before. Uh, we found it from our regional exploration work, went into an area that hadn't been explored before. And um, last year, we carried out the first drilling program on, uh, on Blue Lake. Um, and you can see that uh, why it was a priority. You've got uh, coincident uh, geological, geochemical, and geophysical anomaly. It's only about uh, four kilometers from Cora. And uh, so we put an initial fence line of six holes. You can see the um, very first hole that we put in, K1, uh, we got um, KMDD1, sorry. We got 175 meters at. Uh, two three percent copper and i think 0.28 gram per ton gold so basically we identified with the initial uh six holes which were uh, up to 500 meters deep we identified a large porphyry system 
um, almost every single hole intersected the zone of, of uh, propolytic alteration. And so we showed we've got a large system that has um, a lot of metal associated with it. Um, we've got a second program planned this year with a second, uh, with uh, three or four more holes to be drilled as a fence line, four to 500 meters deep, and then vectoring in on the deeper target, which is the potassic core. So we're very excited about this uh, and looking forward to, to that drilling program second half of the year. All of the work we've done, the consultants work that we've done certainly uh, gives us a lot of confidence that we've got a very large porphyry system. It, we know it's got a lot of metal and, and now it doesn't have that, uh, that high grade potassium core. So if we look at 2020, we're going to continue to focus on our safety and looking at uh, zero loss time injuries. Looking to sign a new MOA, which is a memorandum of agreement, which covers our relationship with community and, and what have you. Continue to focus on expanding the long-term sustainability projects, um, which is creating more jobs, joint venture supplier uh, agreements, infrastructure service development, etc. And importantly, as far as I'm concerned, it's the scholarships and it's education. Um, complete stage two expansion achieve that run rate of 1,100 uh, tons per day. And um, then looking at the exploration front, Cora Cora North resource update, obviously we've done. Um, expansion of that, we're busy with right now as we speak. Drill program at Blue Lake, plan for second half of the year. And Cora, a long strike, um, we're actually looking to be drilling that from underground um, by the fourth quarter. So um, hopefully that's given you some picture of the, of the company. I, I just point out a couple of things in relation to COVID-19 and what have you. So the first case of COVID-19 was identified in, in PNG in uh, around mid-March. Um, a state of emergency was immediately declared that stopped all international arrivals um, and stopped all domestic flights and uh, travel between provinces domestically apart from approved things like food um, and fuel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Impact on us was um, first off that we run, as, as I mentioned earlier, with about 5% expatriates. So we had about 17 expatriates on site at that time. Um, obviously can't fly in and out expatriates. Secondly, about 30% of our nationals are from wider afield, and so they have to either fly in and out or drive in and out from other provinces, so that was uh, stopped. In terms of transport, no impact at all because the Port of Ley, we're considered to be in that province. We actually, uh, we're actually half in the, in the province of Morobi, half in Eastern Highlands, um, so for the purposes of goods coming in, no issue. In terms of nationals, we applied for, as did the industry, a, an exemption to be able to move our people around. And we were provided it subject to having in place the appropriate protocols, which we, uh, which we had approved by the state of emergency controller. And so we've been able to move our, our nationals around. So that particular issue um, covered. In terms of our international, our expatriates, um, we applied for an exemption, and again, we'll provide an exemption subject to having an acceptable protocol. Our protocol, I think, was the first in the industry that was accepted by the controller, the SOE controller. And in fact, we've just um, completed a complete change out of our expatriates. Uh, the guys actually arrived on site today, having spent two weeks in quarantine in Port Moresby. And the guys who were on site and, and so when the state of emergency was declared, we gave all of our fly-in, fly-outs and drive-in, drive-outs the option of, of heading home. Um, the vast majority of the nationals elected to stay on site and all but one of the expatriates remained on site. Um, as a result, operationally, we've continued pretty much 
as we had, except of course we didn't do the expansion as I said. But operationally, um, we've uh, we've been operating uh, as normal, and uh, in fact we've had some some pretty good numbers. I think we're, we're pretty pleased with what we've seen, um, and we're now, as I said, having this changeover of uh, expats as well. So we've really been able to continue our operation. Government have been extremely supportive. They've been quite clear. They see mining as a uh, as a critical industry. Resource sector, 85% of all exports into uh, export value and PNG is from the resource sector. So it's critical to, to the government. And uh, they've been very, very supportive in terms of doing whatever they can to make sure that we can, uh, we can t continue to operate. We have um, COVID testing on site. So we have an ability to test for COVID, the uh, uh, Gen X machine. Um, so not just for, uh, um, generic, but actually specifically to COVID. And so, uh, and we have an isolation area, et cetera, et cetera. So we're very, very well set up in, uh, in that context. Um, exploration wise, as I've said, we're looking to restart in the coming quarter um, and possibly even as early as later this month. Um, capital projects, we're looking at the, at the coming quarter to basically uh, restart those as well. So we're in, uh, we're in, uh, very very good position in terms of uh, of COVID nineteen and and by the way there's now I think eight cases in PNG, most of them are, are up to the very very north quite isolated that's the border with uh, with Indonesia. So with that, Derek, I might uh, might hand over to you. Great, thanks, John. I really appreciate that uh, that update on COVID nineteen. You uh, you solved one of the questions I don't have to ask now, <laughs> uh, and it's important. I think uh, having for, for all our viewers, ask that question to almost all of our CEOs now um, on these webinars and, and, and privately. And uh, I would have to say that uh, um, K92's uh, plan and how they've weathered it is, is probably is, has been uh, better than uh, better than some. So it's uh, congratulations, John, to you and your team for uh, for managing it so well. Um, so we've got basically we have a bunch of questions on the line and 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 they sort of fall into three categories. So I'm going to try and group them, group them that way. And maybe we'll start in uh, sort of the order the presentation uh, went in. Um, maybe talk a little bit uh, first about the expansion. A couple of questions on, on, on timing. And obviously this is on COVID-19 dependent. And, and so there is some flex in these. Um, there was some discussion. There was a question from Patrick on uh, when do you think the phase two expansion will be completed? And maybe on, on the detail on that, both when you'll be ready to produce that, that 400,000 tons per annum from the underground and when you think you'll be able to commission the commission the mill. Okay, so the plan had always been um, that we would start commissioning the plant at the end of March um, and that the mine would only get up to the run rate of 1,100 tons a day around mid fourth quarter. Uh, the mine in the first quarter was running ahead of the plant. So, if you look at the first quarter, I think we started the quarter with about 2,000 tons and we finished it with about 17 or 18,000 tons of stockpile. So the stockpile had gone up. Meanwhile, if you look at our first quarter, it was a record plant throughput. So we were achieving record plant throughput just about on the equivalent to uh, 550 tons a day, yet the mine had been going faster. So the idea was that then the, the new plant, uh, the plant expansion gets commissioned and we start using up that stockpile as the mine increases its, its production through to the 1100 tons a day by mid fourth quarter. So where we're sitting right now is we've got plus or minus 20,000 tons of stockpile. The plant is it's doing better than it's designed to do right now because the plant guys, you know, the way things work, either the plant or the mine is ahead. For the life of our project, the plant boys have been ahead, and they basically said to the miners, "You know, you guys, you know, you got to get your shit together because really, you're not, you're not delivering." And the first quarter was the first time that the mining guys got ahead and said, "You plant guys, you got to get your shit together because you're not." And you know, they thought, "Oh yeah, we're getting an expansion. We'll show you guys." And then the expansion hasn't occurred. So the plant boys are. They do pretty well in getting getting tons through. It would be fair to say. Um, so, simple answer to your question is: we still believe at this point in time, the 1,100 tons a day will be by the by mid 
to end of Q4 from underground. The plant at this point in time, depending on what happens with state of emergency and all the rest of it, we believe we'll commission this coming quarter. Now, we've withdrawn our guidance, which was 110 to 120. Um, we will give an update on that in due course uh, when we have more certainty. I, I think it would be fair to say we anticipate that we'll produce more, significantly more answers than last year. Will we get to the 120? No, I don't think so. Not, not when we haven't commissioned the plant. Could we get to the lower end of that? Possibly, but so we're somewhere in between right now. And we don't have that uh, uh, detail as yet. And then I guess uh, looking now, I mean, phase two isn't quite done yet. You're already starting to talk about phase three, which is the, the I guess, a luxury of having a, a sizable resource behind you to uh, to look at it. Um, with the team, the, the twin, the, uh, I guess the, my apologies, John. The uh, on the uh, on the on the twin dean clients, obviously you've committed to go ahead with that uh, already, uh, and based on the resource, that makes uh, makes good sense. Um, when when can investors expect sort of some details on on phase three and what the timing uh, the timing looks like on that? Or sorry, okay. phase, yeah, phase three. Yeah. Phase three, um, PEA uh, draft, as I said, will get out end of this month, and we uh, anticipate putting out a forty three one hundred one which will incorporate the new resource and the PEA um, first half of July. And that will give a uh, detail of what that project looks like. And uh, we'll include in that then feasibility study, our anticipated time to complete that feasibility study, which at this point in time is Q2 next year. And, uh, and Q2 next year with um, a target of going ahead with or uh, making a formal decision to go ahead middle of the year Q3. But as you've said, the twin incline is, is uh, already committed to. And interestingly, you would have noticed in that long section, the twin incline now goes through the resource. Uh, you know, three months ago, uh, we got a few questions of why are you putting a twin incline there? There's no resource near it. And we said, you know, this is field of dreams. Build it and they will come. Build it and it will come to you. It's, uh, it's a challenge for the geologists. We'll, we'll, we'll put the ramp there, make sure the resource gets there, right? <laughs> um, on the, uh, and, I, and maybe uh, that's, a, that's a good segue into some of the, 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 the exploration questions that we have. Um, maybe talk, you know, from, from your perspective, uh, what do you think the, because you have lots of targets, both sort of in mind, near mind, and then uh, and then the, the the blue sky with uh, with Blue Lake. Which targets are, are you most excited about, and do you think are going to get the best exposure this year for for K ninety two? Well, first off, when you've got, and you can you can argue as to whether it's a tier one yet or it's going to become a tier one, but you've got a high grade. Uh, resource, which is certainly pushing the tier one uh, uh, category. When you've got that and you know that you're going to add resource, you know you're going to add resource to it, that's got to be exciting. So, and when you know that you've got three, four rigs are going to be drilling underground, you've got another couple of rigs on the surface and you're, and you're going to expand that resource, that's got to be pretty exciting. And, and that information will continue to come out balance of this year. Um, for me personally, Kerempe is, is, is quite exciting because it's, it's, it's close to us. It's never been on the radar. Um, and uh, we've got a rig sitting there waiting to restart um, 50 meters down. You know, two days later, state of emergency, we'd have, we'd have had our first intersection. Um, so that's... That's that's pretty exciting. Um, porphyries, in many ways, I mean, they are, you know, they're the you're now getting into the tens of millions of ounces and and, and all the rest of it. They are they are longer term number one, and they and they cost number two. Um, so we we're pretty excited by Blue Lake, um, the VP exploration. He's you know, he's very excited by it, but, you know, he's a geologist. Geologists are excited by everything until they drill it and find there's nothing there, and then they get excited by the next thing. You know, it's, it's like chasing women. Um, 
So right now, Blue Lake does look um, uh, very, very good. I mean, some of the people we've had look at it, the consultants um, for this stage of the program said the best they've seen. So it is, it is for this stage of the program really exciting. But remember, we're talking about having put six holes in Porphyry. You don't find porphyries in six holes or twelve holes or you know, whatever. It takes it takes time to to uh, to do that, but that certainly has enormous potential. And and we need to look at you know how we go forward with that one. The great thing that we've been able to do is that we fund our exploration out of our cash. We're not going to the market to say, listen, boys, give us some money, dilute your share, dilute our number of our shareholders. And we'll go and do some more drilling and see what we can do for you. We we generate cash. We use it to expand the mine. And we use it to do exploration to expand our resource. And what we don't do when we're doing all this is dilute our shareholders. And that we continue to look to do. We're, we're, we're sort of chasing what we would call the holy grail. Expansion without dilution. Uh, and that's, you know, and you guys have demonstrated that, uh, especially with the low capex, capex expansion of phase two, you've demonstrated ability to do that. Um, and I think that's a nice, uh, a nice segue to, because uh, we're, we're, we're getting a little bit short on time, but there have been a few questions on sort of um, corporate strategy and, and, and K92 as a whole and, and, and the jurisdiction. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll shift over to those. So uh, PNG, obviously you've operated there for, for, for several years. Um, obviously, uh, so has Barrick, and there's been a lot of noise lately. They've made between them and the government. There's been a lot of noise on 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 PNG as a as a viable jurisdiction. Um, do you have any comment on that as to how that potentially affects uh, affects K92 and, and the work that you're doing? Look, I, I'd I'd love to say it doesn't affect us at all. But the reality is that the market look at it, it does affect us. It affects our share price. Um, Porgra is a unique situation within PNG and possibly within the world. It is a mine from a bygone era, an era when, as a, as an industry, we did things that now we shouldn't do. You look at Porgra, um, environmentally, it's not a great mine. Barrick would tell you that. It puts all of its tailings into the river. It puts a lot of its waste rock into the river as well. It impacts communities downstream. Um, when it started, it was a relatively small, extremely high-grade operation. I know because I was involved. I'm ex-MIM, Gold Division, and MIM and Plas have built that mine. I was involved in Porgra in 93, 94, so I know a little bit about the history of Porgra, let me assure you. It was built as a relatively low tonnage, high-grade operation, and yes, it put the tailings in the river. Now it is a low lower grade, far, far lower grade, far, far higher tonnage operation, still doing the same thing. So there's a major impact environmentally with what that does. Socioeconomic impact is quite substantial. As in many third world countries, you, you create these mines and people flock to them. And that's what's happened. The, it, it's more than a tenfold increase in people. And that has created a lot of social uh, upheaval as well. And, and the, the third issue that, that comes into this is, is what is what is the operator, what does Barrick intend? Because Barrick previously intended to leave PNG. They sold us Kenantu. They sold half of their interest in Porgra to, to Zision. And so the, the intent for Barrick was to leave PNG. Now they want to renew the mining lease and the government's saying, but hold on, you, you, you're going to leave. Why, you know, what's going on here? Now, what Barrick is saying is, look, no, 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 we're not going to leave anymore. We're going to recapitalize poor. We want to stay. We want to build it up again. The problem for government is that, but that isn't what you said in the past. And at the same time, you've got all these environmental issues. You've got socioeconomic issues. As a mine, that is a, that, that's a serious challenge. And the, the, when you look at the impact on people, the people who are entitled to royalty, who are involved in the project, who actually have a 5% interest, which Barrick brought in, are the people around the lease. They are not the people that are impacted by what goes on from the mine. And so th there's a real challenge for Barrick and there's a real challenge for the government to get to a solution that will that, work. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very unique and very tough uh, uh, situation to be in. And 
for us, I mean, poverty is not something we would want to be involved in. We would not want to be involved in the mind. A, a mind like that, I would not want to be involved in. It is, it is from a bygone era when, when as an industry, we did things differently. We don't do things like that anymore. You would never build a, a poverty today. Barrack would never build a poverty today. You'd never get approval in almost any country in the world. So that creates uh, a problem. I, I, I believe that they'll get a solution. And what was interesting was that Barrick, when it when it was when the government came out with their decision, Barrick said, "Okay, we'll look at a legal avenue," and they went to the courts in PNG, and they got a decision that said, "Yes, Mr. Government, you need to go back and look at this because no, 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 you can't just do this." So now they're back talking. Independent judiciary. What it actually tells you is PNG has independent judiciary it was set up by Australia and it's been maintained as independent. Now, things happen elsewhere in the world, like Tanzania, for instance. Do you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to see what the law says? No, because there's no independent judiciary. PNG there is. So you've got recourse in the country and, and you've got a government that is very supportive of, of industry and was in a is in a tough position. Both of them are in a tough position. I wouldn't like to be having to to to, to get an outcome. But you know what? There's a couple of smart guys here. Mark's a very smart guy. Governments, uh, you know, certainly trying to come up with something. So you know, I think they'll they'll get somewhere. And I think from from a headline perspective, that was my short answer, by the way. That was, from a from a headline perspective, that'll certainly help. And I think that's I think that's why um, you know. There's, I, I assume that's also probably why you have such a focus on your community relations and, and what the work that you guys do in your own community to, to help prevent those sort of bygone era issues from, uh, from coming in, uh, coming into uh, uh, your operations. So I think that's tailing stem. Okay. We run a tailing stem. We have no impact. Our, our footprint is smaller than almost anything you'll see. It, uh, we run as a any first world country would in terms of what we do environmentally people in png when, when the most important thing we do isn't the most expensive thing we do the most important thing we do is scholarships that is local people some of whom never finished school in fact the majority didn't finish school but they want their kids to go through university and we are paying i think currently for something like 56 kids to go through university or higher education and I want that expanded. Um, that is where you are investing in the country and the people that you're with. It's, and, and that is really, really important. And, and, and the people themselves see that. Guys have never had a chance to finish school. But he wants his son to go through or he wants his daughter to right. go through university. Right. That, that opportunity to, uh, to lift, the, the, lift your local community up. Um, as, 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 a, as, a, as a byproduct of mining, uh, as opposed to some of the other uh, things. I, I think that's really important in this day and age. Um, maybe shifting a little more to uh, um, on corporate strategy, a couple questions on m which I know are very difficult to answer. Um, the, uh, the, the first question, I, 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 this might be a little bit easier. Uh, this will be the easier one of the two. From a K92 perspective, are you guys looking at potentially diversifying out of the PNG and looking at other jurisdictions or, you know, with the expiration uh, that you have and the, and the expansion potential that you have that you, you mean, you've got, you've got, you've got enough on your plate. I think the, the answer to that is that we are certainly looking at potential diversification. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, and, and there are drivers for that. If you're a multi-asset company, your, your, mul your multiples are always better. Um, COVID-19, uh, you know, we're, we're operating in PNG. If we were operating in Australia, for instance, it would be easier to be doing than operating in PNG. But it might not be because, you know, COVID just throws up all these things. So certainly from the risk perspective, and I'm not, I'm not talking about PNG as a risky place. I'm talking about things like COVID that have now come. From a risk perspective, having multiple assets clearly makes sense. Um, so there is there is certainly that as uh, as an important uh, an important driver um we have certain expertise we have expertise in underground mining for instance high grade that isn't generally uh, as as available and, and and that's an area that that we can uh, we can bring to it 
the same time, we've got a strong balance sheet and we've got an ability to provide finance, et cetera, et cetera, which gives us certain benefits, we think, in, in potentially looking at uh, looking opportunities. Um, we've been brought multiple things in PNG, and our view is that, is that we have the best possible thing you could have in PNG. So anything you show us in PNG is not going to be as good as we've got. So therefore, that's not something that we particularly look at. Right. Okay. And and I guess uh, K92, K both with phase two expansion now, phase three is, is obviously going to be starting to catch the, and the expiration upside is going to be catching the radar of, of, of your larger peers. Um, I, I, and I, I, this is difficult to answer. The question came from several people on the line, but uh, um, is, are you starting to see uh, increased interest from, uh, from, from, from the majors or is that, uh, uh, are they still uh, hesitant on PNG based on what's going on with Barrick? Um, I'm not sure if people are hesitant on PNG necessarily based on what's going on with Barrick. I think a lot of corporately people understand <clears throat> the the issues in power people understand the mind they, who are in the industry um wolfie Golpu is going ahead wolfie Golpu is newcrest and harmony if you look at that slide of ours with lease areas you'll see that rio tinto is is actually quite close to us they've got leases quite close to us they've come back into png um b2 gold came into png last year i think so they're doing expiration there um and they're in our in our region, so um, I, I'd say that I, I don't. PNG isn't for everyone. It, in the same as Brazil isn't for everyone, or uh, I was going to say Venezuela is not for anyone. But um, you know, there's a there's a few other places that might be really challenging. Yeah. Um, we've got quite a number of companies operating in PNG and operating successfully, and of course, the very large uh, uh, oil and gas people. Are in are in PNG and operating very successfully, so I, I don't think that necessarily puts puts anyone off. Um, are we seeing increased um, with with COVID nineteen? We're not seeing much at all, actually. You know, because we're not allowed to because we're all locked up. Um, look, we, we are cognizant of where we sit. We are cognizant of having what we believe is now a tier one asset and being one of the highest grade. In the world and and one that is easily expanded because we're busy doing it right now and it's going to have a long long life so we're very cognizant of that and uh we're aware that you know that that, that puts us in a certain position this company has no strategy that says you know what we've we've got to tart ourselves up because you know we would we, like to encourage people to come and talk to us our strategy is to maximize the value we bring to the table of the asset that we have, which we've, I think, been very successful at doing over the last two or three years, at a very, very low cost, um, and, and have a strategy that looks at how do we further deliver to shareholders. And I know that every single CEO that's going to sit here and talk to you guys is going to say the same thing. You know, it's, it's all about shareholders. You know, we're, we're there to increase the value of shareholders. And the reality is the majority, I think, are, and you get some that aren't. You know, it's like, this is a good lifestyle. I quite enjoy what I do, et cetera, et cetera. I love what I do. I absolutely love what I do. But first and foremost, my job is to actually make money for shareholders. And I am a shareholder, and I'm a substantial shareholder. It's to make money for my shareholders. And I do that by bringing value to the table in the asset I have and looking at the strategies that I've got, which includes looking at other M&A opportunities, other opportunities that we can acquire assets to maximize that value. And at the end of the day, the whatever comes and is the best outcome for your shareholders, that's what you need to be doing. And that's, that's very much our intent. And I'd say one thing, over 5 million ounces, over 10 grams per ton, puts a target on your back. And we are cognizant of that. And so we're working damn, damn hard to make it six and seven and eight and to generate more cash flow so that the market can see our value and we protect our shareholders in terms of getting the best return they can on their investment. 
That is a, a great spot to leave it. We have a few more questions, but uh, I think in the interest of time, we're now uh, just over an hour that we've been going on. So sorry about that. We, uh, it's okay. It, I think it was. It, it was it, I think it, it was great. Um, I'd like to. I, I think I'd like to thank John and of K92 and for K92 for joining us on this webinar today. I think it was a, a very productive thing and a great way to learn about the company and what what's to come ahead. Um, and on, on behalf of Red Cloud Securities, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. I'd like to thank you, John, for taking the time uh, in, the, in your evening to, uh, to join us. Uh, for Red Cloud, just as a reminder, our next, uh, our next webinar is, uh, is June 18th. Uh, I suspect there might be a couple between here and there, but the next one scheduled is June 18th uh, with Equinox Gold. So thank you very much, John, and uh, have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thanks for setting everything up. Have a good one, as we say. <laughs>